I, um, my wife and I have three uh, daughters. Uh, one's four, one's two, and one is six weeks old. So I heard a uh-oh, yeah, uh-oh is right. Um, and it's been amazing. It's, it's the greatest gift in life. Uh, our oldest daughter, when um, she was old enough to kind of go to her room for nap time and we have in her room like a little camera up on the wall. You parents have these things. I don't know what y'all used to do. You used to have to actually like parent your kid and go check on them. We just put a camera on the wall. And for a lot of years, um, our oldest daughter would have no idea who was talking to her when the voice would come through the camera. It was amazing. And um, I can remember the first time she was supposed to go to her room. It was, you know, it was nap time, supposed to get into her bed. And um, she, you know, is like this, and you can see her kind of like looking around, like, does anybody see me? And then she slides out of her bed and goes over to where all the toys are. I mean, we can hear her underneath her room, like just banging with toys on the floor. But I looked on the camera, and you can just see her having the time of her life doing what she's not supposed to be doing. Any parents know this? And so I just got on my phone, too lazy to walk upstairs, hit the button, and said, mercy. And immediately, she just went like this. <laughs> and took off running into the corner of her room where she grabs her frozen blanket and a few stuffed animals, puts them over her head, and just hides in the corner. I can remember now that our oldest two are old enough to uh, really fight and someone cries. They used to fight, nobody would cry, they'd just argue, but now one person cries. And I remember uh, the first time they were fighting and uh, our younger daughter started crying and she said, um, you know, mercy hit me, mercy hit me. And as mom and dad walk into the room, we immediately ask the question, what happened here? With a little bit of umph, you know, like trying to scare them a little bit. What happened in here? And immediately the guilty party would, would get eyes like this and would just take off run out the door, into their room, into the bed, covers over them. This is our tendency, isn't it? It's your tendency and it's my tendency. Uh, our hiding is way more sophisticated than that of a three-year-old. But the technical term in the moment where I came across the camera is busted. <laughs> Have you ever been busted? That, that moment where all the stuff you hoped you could stuff deep away enough in the closet to where it would never come back out, all of a sudden comes back out and you have to face it in reality and in that moment, everything in you screams, take off and run and get in the closet, pull the covers over you and hide. We, we've been hiding for a long time and the hope of today is that some of us would come out of hiding and experience the freedom that is in Christ. In Genesis, in the earliest account of the creation story, on page two, God creates everything. And it's, it's beautiful. Page one and page two, God creates everything. At the end of chapter two, I want you to see this verse in verse 25. It says that Adam and his wife, Eve, were both naked and they felt no Shame. So in the kingdom of God, in the perfect creation of the garden, it was possible for Adam and Eve to be fully themselves in front of God. Nothing hidden, nothing unexposed. Everything we are before each other and before Almighty God. And yet in us, there's no, there's no temptation to hide, no desire to cover up, no, 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 no longing in us to not bring our true selves. It was possible for them to be fully exposed and yet have no desire to run and hide. And then you get to page three. We don't make it too far before we wreck everything. And it says this, after they've been tempted by a lie to do what God said not to do, been tricked into thinking that their way was better than God as rebellion enters into the human story. It says this in verse seven of chapter three, that the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened and they realized that they were naked. 
So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The truth is for many of us in this room across all of our locations today, that we're familiar with that place. Our hiding is way more sophisticated than a three-year-old and it's gotten way better than sewing together fig leaves. For many of us, we hide in our success. We hide in our guilty pleasures. We hide in things that we think will never be exposed. We hide in our success even. We find a place where we can go, where we feel like the real us will never be exposed and yet the us that's there is somewhat good enough for us to live with. And that's not the life God wants for you. And it's not the life God wants for me. The invitation today is an invitation for all of us. The message of today is that freedom is ours in Christ. That's what Christian is singing about. That, that, that the death does not have the final say in our lives, but there's another part of the story, which is death actually has been defeated and conquered. Jesus came, Jesus lived the life we couldn't live, died the death we deserved in our place, and yet was raised from the dead and raised us up from the dead with him. It is possible for you to experience freedom in our lives. Our story is a story of grace, where we did not get what we deserve. Grace is amazing. It, it cannot be earned. It, it, it was not deserved. And it cannot be lost. But I've learned in my time following Jesus, it can be forgotten. And I just want to lovingly put it on the table today and have all of us fix our eyes on the reality that we have been offered grace by Almighty God. And in that, step out of hiding into the light and find freedom. The title of the message today is Goodbye Shame. And I wanna encourage you to lean in. If you've been crippled by guilt or shame because of something you've done in the past, because of something that's been done to you in the past, I want you to lean in that you might find freedom today. This is not a self-help message. This is not a feel-good message. This is gritty theology anchored in the word of God where we celebrate what was accomplished for us on the cross at Calvary, and it is possible for you, and it is possible for me. Shame is a crippling force. We all know that to be true. I believe that it's one of the most effective tools of the enemy to keep us locked away in a corner, never fully stepping into the light of who God has called us to be and what God has called us to do. And yet for some of us, it's comfortable in the corner. And we would rather stay there than risk coming out lest we be judged or have to pay some penalty that we're not sure we can afford. Guilt and shame oftentimes get clumped together, but there is some slight differences. I wanna talk about them first before we land in the text for today. Guilt is action-based. Guilt is what you feel when you do something wrong. It's a legal term. You, you do something, you're caught, you're put on trial, the evidence confirms that you did it, the gavel drops, you are guilty. You feel guilty for something that you do. That's what guilt is. It's a legal term. It's positional. I am guilty. I did that thing. Shame is different. It's not action-based. It is identity-based. Whereas guilt says, I did something bad, shame says, I am something bad. Shame is where the actions that we are guilty of begin to define our identity and dictate who we are. We feel guilty for what we do. We feel ashamed of who we are. In Luke chapter 15, you can see the difference of these two in a very famous uh, story of the prodigal son. In, in verse uh, 18, you know the story, the younger brother runs away, he, re he squanders everything, he wrecks his life on wild living is what the scripture says. And look in verse 18, as he's beginning to make his way back home, he says this, Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven and against you. That's guilt. I have sinned, I'm guilty of that. But then look what he says in the very next verse. 
He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's That's shame. Guilt says, "I, I, I did it. I'm guilty. I sinned. Shame says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Guilt says, I am in the wrong, I did it. And shame says, I am wrong and I no longer belong in the story. This is the difference in the two. Revelation confirms that the enemy is the great accuser. He would love to keep you trapped in guilt and shame. And for many of us, you could be in church for 25 years, come in, sing the songs every week, celebrate the message every single week, and yet go home and you could still be tempted by the accuser to go back into the corner, to pull the blanket over you, to grab a few stuffed animals that make you feel better, and to sit in your shame one more week. And I think it's time today that we take hold of the freedom that Christ has purchased for us and we step into the light We're going to spend the rest of our time together in Romans, uh, an incredible book. I would say it's my favorite book in the Bible. I'm not sure if you're supposed to have favorite books in the Bible, but uh, it's mine. It's a theological masterpiece. It's a freedom book. It's our story, and it's brilliantly written. And I think the greatest chapter of that is Romans chapter 8. That's where we're going to spend the rest of our time together. It's a great freedom chapter, and it provides us with freedom that maybe some of you don't know that you have. I don't know everybody's story in the room, but I do know one word that describes us all. Guilty. That everybody in this room, everybody in every room watching this, everybody in every living room watching this message today, we all have one thing in common. We are guilty. We are born guilty, dominoing from Adam's fall all the way into us. And if you, if you, if you have kids, you, you know that. I used to wrestle with that. Like, I don't really know about the sin nature. Can you have a little innocent kid? And then you change your first diaper and you're like, yeah, there's a sin nature here for sure. We're born into this curse. Every single one of us is guilty. And maybe even as that word gets said today, guilt and shame, there's an image that crosses across your mind. There's a place you don't really want to go back to that you thought you got away from. But if, if, if you thought you got away from it and all the enemy has to do is say one word, shame, and it takes you right back, then did you really get away from it? We don't need convincing that we're guilty. Most of us are well aware of that. The early chapters of Romans, beginning in chapters one, two, and three, you see this idea that everybody's guilty. The Jews are guilty. The Gentiles are guilty. Everybody is guilty. Romans three, verse 23, all have sinned, everyone, and fall short of the glory of God. You're like, man, this is such great news. Honey, aren't you so glad we woke up and got dressed and came to church today? It's important that this is in the text because the good, the bad news sets up the good news. We, we have to understand how desperate we are in order to claim the opportunity that Christ has put in front of us. And I love that all through the book of Romans, there's this legal language. I don't know how familiar you are with the courtroom. I hope not very, unless you're a judge or an attorney. I, I'm not that familiar. You should celebrate in that, that as one of the pastors here, I do not spend a lot of time in the courtroom. So I may get some of the language wrong, but Paul uses this legal language and paints this picture of a heavenly courtroom all throughout Romans. And I want us to go into that place. If you've been there, I want, I want to just see us today traveling into that courtroom as if our life is under question. As if the accuser is asking in front of the great judge of all creation, the almighty one, and is asking, "Uh, did you do that? And we would say, yeah, uh uh-huh, we did do that. Oh, did you do this? Yes, uh uh-huh, we did. Yeah, did you do that? Did you do this? Are you guilty of this? Did you do this? And all of our answer is, yes, 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 we did. Yes, I'm not proud of it, but yes, I did do that in college. Yes, I did do that, you know, when I was in high school. Yes, I did do that. And and, and the images of that have stuck with me. And, And so it's as if we're on stand and the enemy is accusing, 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 accusing. And yet somehow the judge takes all the information And as he declares his verdict, given every piece of information there is, the gavel drops and he says to you and he says to me, not guilty. How can that be? It's not enough to know that that is true because you have an accuser that's going to make you doubt that every single day of your life. 
It's not enough to know that we can be free in Christ. You have to know why, how am I free? What happened to make me free? What happened in the heavenly courtroom in that moment that given all of my information put on the table that the judge could look at everything about my life and somehow declare me innocent? How can that be? This is why we're here today. This is why billions of people woke up on planet earth today to come and worship God. And I think the clearest place we see the answer is in Romans chapter eight in the first four verses. So let's go there and spend some time there uh, together. I want you to see it, so I'm gonna uh, try to draw on this. My handwriting is uh, fairly bad, not as bad as Pastor Louis, but uh, it's bad, so uh, hang with me. I wanna read it first and then we'll uh, dig into it a little bit. Romans eight, verses one through four. Therefore, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And maybe should have been an amen there. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, Romans is written by Paul. And when Paul starts in this first word, he's linking everything back. This therefore, give me a second, I'll get there. This therefore is linking everything back to chapters five through eight, and honestly, all the way back to the beginning of Romans, where in the very chapter before, in Romans chapter seven, Paul, expressing his grief with his own sin, say, I'm always doing the thing I don't wanna do, and I'm never doing the thing that I wanna do, and then he asked the great question, who is it that's gonna set me free from the bondage of sin and death? And we find that answer in the therefore here. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Some of you just need to take those two words and and, and just put them in your mirror at home, in your dashboard, in your car. There is now no condemnation. For who? For those who are in Christ. Are you in Christ? This chapter and these few verses offer a great reality. There really are only two types of people in the world. There's really only two categories of people in the world. You are either in Christ or you are not in Christ. And John 3, 16 and 17 talk about that those who are in Christ are not condemned, but those who are not in Christ, they're condemned already. So for those of us who are in Christ, there is now no condemnation. Because, why, how can that be? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life and has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now this word here, law, is an interesting word in the original language. It doesn't necessarily mean the Mosaic law. It means, uh, it can mean the Mosaic law, but it's more broad than that. It means any type of system where a penalty is required for not meeting that. So Paul's using this as a way to say, hey, for all of you Jews, if you think that you can somehow uh, experience the freedom of condemnation by obeying the Mosaic law, you're never going to get there. And for you Gentiles, if you think that your personal goodness is somehow going to be good enough to save you, it's never going to do that. We've been free from the law of sin and death. For what the law, different word, now we're talking about the Mosaic law, was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. What does that mean? It means that the law can't do something. What can it not do? Well, namely two things. One, it cannot remove your condemnation, verse one. Two, it cannot provide for you life instead of death, verse two. The law helps us to see that we're guilty, that we can't measure up to the standard of a holy God. But the law cannot save us because it was weakened by the flesh. And then look at these words. This is our whole story. God did it. 
You wanna know in the great high courtroom of heaven how all of your details of your life can somehow come before the judge and he could declare you not guilty? How could that be? God did it. That's how that can be. This is a gospel message that there was a great substitute for us that condemnation went somewhere else instead of us even though it was deserved to be on us. God did it. You you see this story all throughout the New Testament. Ephesians, some of the greatest verses in the Bible, chapter two, you were dead in your sins, verse one. Verse two, you were tied up in sin and controlled by sin. Verse three, you were deserving of death, condemned in sin. And yet verse four, but God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. God did it. It's important that you get this. How did he do it? By by sending his own son in the likeness, important word here, in the likeness. Why is it important that it was in the likeness of the flesh? Does it mean that he wasn't fully man? No, that's essential for our salvation, that God was fully man, 100% man and 100% God. So why would we say in the likeness of the flesh? Because if Jesus was a sinner, we should all go home. He was in the likeness of flesh and yet he had never sinned. So he was the only one, the perfect, spotless, holy lamb of God that was the only person who could possibly come into the high courtroom of heaven and stand in our place and let the gavel drop on him and not on us. That's why it's important that this word likeness of sinful flesh, not sinful flesh, likeness of sinful flesh, to be a sin offering for whom? This, this, let these verses wash over you really quickly. Romans 4, 25. He, Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Galatians 1, 4. Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God, our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself, Christ, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that, why, we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Why a sin offering? What was purchased at the offering? We were purchased at the offering. (laughs) That, That Jesus paid for sin so that we could be set free from the guilt and shame of our sin in our lives. And then I want you to see maybe the most, for me, maybe my favorite verse in all of the Bible. And so he, who's, who's the he? God. So he, God, condemned. So, so there was condemnation that happened. It wasn't just that God somehow swept everything you ever did under the rug of heaven. There was a condemning of sin. Whose sin? Whose sin? My sin and your sin. So God condemned my sin. Where did he do it? In the flesh. Whose flesh? Not my flesh. This is the whole point of the gospel that somehow God, almighty God, who cannot turn his head, he cannot sweep things under the rug. There had to be a penalty. That's what the word condemnation means. There had to be a price paid for the guilt and shame and sin of our lives. And so this text says that so God condemned sin. Who? Your sin and my sin. It belonged on me. Where did he condemn it? Not in me, but on Jesus so that I could be set free and you could be set free. Now, can I just lovingly ask you this? If that's true, and I know everybody in this room maybe doesn't think that that's true yet, but if that's true, what in the world are we doing sitting in the corner of our room with the blanket over our head with a few stuffed animals tucked close? If there is now therefore no condemnation for you in Christ, why? Because it just vanished. No, 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 no because there was a substitute who took every single drop of it. And if he did, there's no more left for you to drink. The cup of the wrath of God for sin in the world has been poured out in full. So we can break free from the power of shame. Why? Because when the enemy accuses us, 
when he comes at us, when he tries to put us on trial, we can say, hey, this case is already closed. This case happened 2,000 years ago on the hill of Calvary where my sin was paid for. The gavel dropped on Jesus and at the same time dropped on me. He was declared guilty and I was declared innocent. There was no mistrial. It's over. And some of you need to hear that. You are not on trial anymore. In the life of a believer, if you have put your faith in Jesus, if you are in Christ, judgment day is behind you. You are judged based on Jesus' life. And we should celebrate that. And as the enemy accuses us, we ought not feel the guilt and shame and run and hide in the corner. We ought to, yes, let guilt convict us so that we want to live more like Christ and not repeat whatever the guilt has been caused by, for sure. It says there's no condemnation. It does not say there are no consequences. I can't preach that message here. There will be consequences, but there will be no condemnation. And for some of us, We're so afraid of the consequences that we almost think, you know what, we'd rather deal with the condemnation because at least that feels like a personal thing than the consequences of being out in the open. To which I just lovingly want to tell you, you have that so backwards. You're going to live forever for 10 million times 10 million years. And the only one who actually can judge you is already on record saying, I put my son on the table and his life was executed so that you could go free. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Colossians 2, 25, 2 uh, 13 through 15. Let me just read these over you. When you were dead in your sins, which you were, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgives us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. Do you see the courtroom now? He's taken it away nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, the record of our wrongs is how that's translated elsewhere. And for some of us, it's like this little tiny, you know, picture of God. Like somehow, he, you know, here's everything that I did wrong. Like, just like it could fit on this little index card. And this was nailed up to a tree. How cute is that? No, it, it's like if, if we could stack this paper up, you know, like five miles high, that would cover like 1% of it. Like, oh, there's high school years right there. Look, that's a long list there, you know. Got down to college in here. Every sin, past, present, and future. Heaven doesn't miss anything or it wouldn't be run by God. Every sin recorded and yet everyone nailed to the tree. You have been set free. Not pardoned. You know, a pardon is when someone really powerful says, you know what, we're gonna let you go. That's not what happened. That's not the gospel. It's, it's not that God somehow looked on you with kindness and said, you know what? I know you're guilty for everything you did. It's just not that big of a deal. And I have this great sense of power. So I'm just going to tell you you're innocent and you can go. Not what happened. You were acquitted. There's a difference there. Acquitted means that you were tried, that all the information came onto the table and that the judge looked over every single word. He read over every single document of your life. And yet he declared you innocent and declared me innocent. We gotta take hold of that for our lives. The one thing that's never happened when my girls do something wrong and run and hide, I I normally will go find them. I'll let them stay there for a minute, just be honest. So I don't know, that might not be good theology, but I'll let them, just for a minute, I'll let them stay there. And I'll go up and, you know, pull the blanket off their head, sit down next to them, put them in my lap. And I'll say, I love you. And there's nothing that you could do that could change that. I love you. And they'll be crying and, you know, 
got their arms wrapped around me and I'll just keep saying it over them. I love you. I love you. You're gonna have to apologize to your sister and you're gonna have to apologize to mom and dad because you lied to us. So there's, there's gonna be some consequences. But there's no condemnation here. I love you. And never one time has that moment occurred and then they got out of my lap and ran back to the corner. It was as if my voice held so much weight in their life that when I said to them, I love you, I love you, that was enough for them to get out of the corner and to live their life again. And I wonder, does the voice of God hold enough weight over your own voice or the enemy's voice in your life when you hear God saying over you, you're not condemned? I don't hold it against you. Does that hold enough weight for you to get down out of his lap and go, I agree with that. And I'm gonna walk in the freedom of that. Or are you tempted to go back to the corner where you were? I love that chapter eight opens with the fact that there's no condemnation. And chapter in, chapter eight ends with the reality that there's no separation for those who are in Christ. Shame stems from our past. It sidelines us in the present and it steals from our future. So if you're paralyzed by shame right now, and I know we talked about the theological reality of being set free in Christ, but for somebody there's just that sense of, okay, man, I get all that. I kind of get all that. I don't get all that, but I kind of get all that. So like practically, what do I do? Because man, I'm, I'm so deep in shame. Like it's not even the real me that's sitting here right now. I'm not even sure that I remember who the real me is because I put up a fake me so many times that I don't even know how to get back to the real me. I just want to encourage you with three really simple things that will cause shame to die in your life. Number one, confess your sin. Do not conceal it. Get alone with God and confess your sin to God. Shame screams in our ear. You better run and hide because you have no idea what the penalty required for this would be. If anybody finds out, you better hope this doesn't come up. You better hope that there were no witnesses. So run and hide and cover. Shame paralyzes us. What if they found out? Could you imagine what this would cost you? Could you imagine what you might lose? You can't afford that. You better work hard to keep it under wraps. And yet the scripture says in Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Here's what I've learned in my own life. It's possible to hide your sin so good that nobody finds out about it in your life. It's possible to be so good at running so far into the corner that your family doesn't know, that your friends don't know. But one of the things that I love whenever our daughters run and hide is like they, they run in the corner and they cover their head with the blanket, but their feet are sticking out. You ever seen that, you know? Or like they're hiding in the bed, but there's like a very clear like this in the middle of the mattress. I feel like that's how God is when he looks at us. It's like we're trying so hard to hide from, you can't hide from God. He sees everything. And for those of us who are hidden in Christ, there's no need to hide from Christ. He welcomes it. He doesn't say, come here, I love you. There's nothing that could ever separate you from my love. As one uh, person famously said it, don't let them in, don't let them see. Be the good girl. You always have to be. Conceal, don't feel. Don't let them know. Did you know that that song is what our kids are listening to like 20,000 times a day from Elsa? <laughs> Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. This is the problem. <laughs> be the good girl. Don't let anybody know you're not. Run and hide. We fear confessing more than we fear concealing. And God wants to open that door today and say, it's time to come out, come out into the light. You will not receive judgment from me or condemnation from me. You will receive mercy from me. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. Number two, I got to hurry. 
walk in the light. Number one, confess, do not conceal. Number two, walk in the light. If you tell me right now, hey, I just really don't feel like I have a need to walk with some men and, and really like do that whole thing. I will look back at you and say, you are mistaken. <laughs> you need that more than you know you need it so much so that you don't even know that you need it anymore. We as a church have to be committed with linking arms with each other where there is all lights on for somebody. You don't have to come stand up on a platform. You don't have to post about it and be like, look how bad I am today. You need somebody that's gonna come get you when you're in the corner and go, hey, hey, I know you did something wrong. I know that you feel guilt from that. I know there's gonna be consequences from that. But let me remind you that there's no condemnation for you who is in Christ. So we got a life to live and we're gonna live it for the glory of God. We're not gonna be sidelined by shame. You need that in your life. You need to walk in the light. You say, man, well, what, what, what if they judge me? What if I lose some friends? Then you need to get some friends that follow Jesus. Because the message in our story is that we extend what we have received. So if you didn't get condemnation from Jesus, then how dare we ever give condemnation towards others? Let's link arms with some people that will help us walk in the light. And lastly, and I'll close with this. You need to agree with God. I, I, I used to say this all the time, that there, there, there's a time where you gotta be willing to forgive yourself. Then I realized that is like terrible theology. Good thing I went to seminary for seven years. We fixed that. You can't forgive yourself. How are you gonna forgive yourself? Is it the wrong you did was against you? You don't have the power to forgive yourself. But here's what you do have. You have the opportunity today to agree with the one who does have the power to forgive you and already has. And so you don't have to get up on this big high, you know, self-help thing today. You know what? It's just about time that I forgive myself. No, that doesn't work. You can do that. you can be right back where you were tomorrow. But what you can do is you go, you know what? I traveled into the high courtroom of heaven today and my case played out in full. And as that gavel dropped somehow on me, I was declared innocent because Jesus was declared guilty. And I'm going to step into that because there's now therefore no condemnation for me because I'm in Christ. So I'm going to walk in that freedom and agree with God. And when the enemy accuses me, I will not run and hide. I will celebrate the grace of God at work in my life that says, you know what? I am guilty and I did do that, but there's no shame in me. My identity is secure in the person of Christ. This is the opportunity for all of us. Let me pray for us. I am um, coming into our meeting on Tuesday, our program meeting. I had no idea yet that Christian was gonna be leading this moment today and I had this message percolating in my heart. And then I heard Christian's gonna be leading this song and I'm like, God's up to something. It's gonna be a freedom day at Passion City Church. I can feel it. Somebody's gonna step into the light at Passion City Church somewhere, I believe it. Somebody's gonna take hold of the fact that there's not condemnation over their life today. I believe it. Somebody's gonna come out of the hiding today and step into the light today. I believe it. Somebody's gonna confess a thing that happened so long ago that they don't even wanna talk about it, but yet it's still crippling them. Just gonna confess it today and step in the light. I believe that. And so I wanna give you a chance to do that. Two groups of people. And here's how we're gonna do it today, because I think there's something powerful about being in the light. I know it's hard. And everybody wants the moment, can we just turn all the lights, not down, but completely off, like off, off, where you can't even see me? And uh, can we make sure everybody's heads bowed and eyes are closed? Not today. Today's about freedom. And if you've been running and hiding in shame, you don't need to hide as you step out of it. You just need to, in bold faith, step into the promise that God's offered you.